Hi everyone, welcome back to another session of BHA Live, an ongoing series of educational opportunities being hosted by Barbershop Harmony Australia's Harmony Academy. A big welcome to those of you attending their first session tonight, and as always, we welcome back those repeat offenders who have already experienced one of our Friday evening sessions. Before we start, I'll get a little bit of technical housekeeping out of the way. If you've joined us via Zoom, please feel free to use the chat function to talk amongst yourselves. However, if you have a specific question about anything being presented, please make sure you submit that via the Q&A function. This will make sure that the questions all funnel through and get seen. We have a fun interactive session for you tonight. Rather than just have you submit questions via the Q&A function, we'd also like to invite you to submit your questions in person. So if you're happy to join the webcast, just use the raise hand function in Zoom and we'll bring you in to ask your question. Tonight's session is welcoming back two of our finest educators, Vicky Dwyer and Beck Hewitt. Vicky has 20 years of barbershop experience and is a specialist vocal coach, unlocking the tools to achieve vocal freedom and skills for all singers of all ages. She understands and appreciates the nuances of the barbershop style to help you interpret your music in a way that shows off your skills. Vicky has directed choruses since 2002 and has a passion for mentoring upcoming directors, sharing conducting skills, as well as coaching in the areas of rehearsal planning, team training and interpersonal skills. She has an associate diploma in music with combined major in piano and singing. Vicky is a master director for the Circular Keys Chorus and also directs Sydney Harmony. She's also on the SAI Regional Education Faculty for Australia. Vicky currently sings lead with Alouette Quartet and previously competed internationally with Australia's four-time regional champion quartet, Accolade. She's performed and directed on the international stage numerous times, most recently earning a third place Harmony Classic Medal, directing Circular Keys Chorus in 2018. She likes pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. Vicky has a substantial background in both classical and theatre, as well as barbershop. Beck has been actively involved in music and performance for over 25 years as a soloist, band vocalist and choral singer. In the over 16 years since her introduction to Barbershop, Beck has participated as a chorus member, a chorus board member, a vocal teacher, a coach to soloists, quartets and choruses, a quartet singer and a director. She is a singing judge in the Australasian Guild of Barbershop Judges, an education faculty member for both BHA and Sweet Adelines Australia, and is recently an appointee to the Sweet Adelines International Education Faculty. Beck has performed in both small and large choruses, with both choruses winning regional gold medals, and in 2018 directed a national silver medal, medal winning mid-size chorus for BHA. She also competed both regionally and internationally with Australia's seven-time regional champion quartet, Hijinx. As a sought-after coach and teacher, she frequently travels around Australia and to New Zealand, providing voice coaching and teaching aspects of vocal production, music and vocal interpretation, balance, blend and practice techniques. In her life outside of Barbershop, Beck operates her own music business, Just Sing, where she teaches voice and performance to singers of all ages and all styles. With her husband, Aaron, she lives in Perth, Western Australia, with their two ginger cats and puppy, and they love to travel, usually for Barbershop. Beck's musical passion is working with singers and groups and helping them to find their inner voice and realise their potential. So let's get started. I'll hand over the reins to our two presenters for this evening, Vicky and Beck. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a strange environment, this Zoom environment, isn't it? And I thought we'd be used to it by now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I have to say, Vicky, pina coladas, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> So today, everyone, look, we're really trying to make this very much a conversation. So as much as possible, please just jump on in there with your questions and points that you'd like to add to the conversation. But it really is going to be quite sort of open forum conversation here. So with that, with that <laughs> did you have anything? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we're open to all sorts of questions about your voice uh, and we'll do our very best to, um, to answer them to the best of our ability. Uh, if, and if we don't have the answers, we can certainly point you in the direction where you might be able to find those answers. Uh, so, um, Beck, what was our first question? Yes, we had a couple of questions come through on the survey. Thank you to those who did submit some questions. So the first question was, learning to play an instrument like the piano or the clarinet is a complex process to be sure, but learning to sing seems to be a far more mysterious process. Yet singing is the most human of all human behaviours. Every so often you get in the zone and it's just beautiful, effortless sonorities erupt and it all just takes off. So the question is, 
how important are those elemental singing exercises used for warming up the voice in terms of enabling the singer to get into the zone more regularly? I'm going to assume that the person who wrote that actually knows the answer to this. Uh, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so how important is it to be able to uh, work on the flexibility of your voice, the control of your voice in a controlled environment? So when we're doing our vocal exercises, we're really able to focus on the, the hierarchy of our vocal production and our skills. Whereas if we just launched straight into a song, we're really not able to uh, focus on the things that we need to, to focus on. So vocal warm-ups give us uh, the opportunity to focus on our, breathe, our alignment, our breathing, the sound we're making and our tone. We can uh, increase our flexibility and our, and our range. So all of those things are super important because we can control that environment. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, if I, a pianist might be able to play the C major scale really well, but that doesn't mean they're going to launch into Rachmaninoff. So, oh. so it is that whole thing of, of you know, um, providing leveled um, steps that allow us to work our voice. And even when you are, for example, you know, on piano playing Rachmaninoff, Rachmaninoff you wouldn't do it without still being able to do your scales, your arpeggios, your Hannon, your, you know, all of that stuff would still be part Mm. of of playing and then uh as we know as singers we might take a a portion of a song that might be difficult for us and let's say it's at a tricky part in our range and then sing it in different parts of our range you know a step lower a step higher to figure out what it is that that might be happening in that piece of music that is tricky for us you know so all of those opportunities are right there in our vocal warm-ups you know singing something on the same vowel that kind of thing so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also in addition to that is the, the fact that the exercises allow us to scaffold a simple muscle memory work in, in a way that our songs don't necessarily give us that opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, lo I love to use sports analogies because, you know, most of us or many of us have played sport in some way. Some way. Um, I'm a terrible golfer. Uh, but I know that if I want to get better at golf, I actually have to go out to the driving range and use the same club and try and hit the same ball in the same way over and over and over again so that I learn the coordination required to make that stroke happen consistently. And that's the other um, really wonderful function of those ex of vocal exercises is allowing us to have that scaffold repetitive motion over the same process, whatever that aspect happens to be but over and over again on that aspect in a way that's just nice and straightforward and repetitive without being interrupted by other things yeah and at the same time perhaps you're a singer who has in chorus rehearsals learned uh, a, a song and perhaps you've learned a mistake whoops <laughs> and, and that can happen to anybody really and so being able to identify that and work through the the you know undo the muscle memory mm by by creating new memories and new skills to be able to relearn or you know correct whatever that problem was yeah you know, we also have muscle memory on things like oh i always run out of breath there well the question is why you know yeah it's, absolutely it's it's not just a i always run out of breath there and i think the typical answer is we'll just take another breath somewhere okay sure that's that's probably a a way to do it if you're in a quartet though perhaps that's not the, going to be the answer so then what kind of things are happening? Is it at a particular part of your range? Was the, the lead into that phrase difficult for you? Did you have a big jump on that mm. breath to get into the start of that phrase? That would potentially mean that your breath was perhaps um, taken in a more tense way mm. that would then say that you didn't get to use your air the way you wanted. Yeah, all those things. So, so yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> absolutely but i guess the the answer is they're vital they really are like they're they they undermine they underpin everything that we do and they definitely undermine it too if we yeah don't do. look, um <laughs> we 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 can have a a warm-up routine and i think the warm-up routine is vital for easing our voice into each of the processes that we're going to ask of it and 
we don't want to strain the voice and you know like I'm thinking about things like you know when you haven't used your voice in in a few days and and this that might not <laughs> that might seem like a weird thing for you and I um, but I actually know people that are, are currently you know uh, living in their in their isolation and perhaps they're um, they might be working from home but perhaps they don't have to you know talk that much maybe a lot of what yeah. their work is is um, you know in, in written communication and what you find is when you don't use your voice for a couple of days your larynx actually raises so it actually yeah. changes position in your throat during those times of not use and so then when you would then launch straight back into singing if you haven't, you know, done your breathing exercises and your alignment exercises and your phonation exercises with your gentle humming and the semi-occluded phonation is actually helping to reseat the larynx. So, um, so you want to do all of that. And Vicky, do you just want to remind everybody what the semi-occluded exercises are about? What that means? <laughs> okay, so semi-occluded <laughs> means that we're actually um, going to limit some of the the breath in the exhalation. So semi-occluded can be using a straw, breathing. Yeah, so I semi- love that you had one ready to go. I was like, I- I've, even got, I've even got a tiny one. I've got this one I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, bubbling, humming, tongue trilling, uh, singing on a v, you know, anything that we're not just, you know, uh, letting the air completely out, you know, that's a semi-occluded vocal exercise. But what it does is it provides backflow of air and that backflow fills the pharynx and the vocal tract in a way that actually helps to relax the larynx back down and it also takes some of that external pressure off the vocal when i say external sorry take some of that pressure off the vocal folds i'll i'll talk about subglottal and, and supraglottal later but um <laughs> if it comes up yeah absolutely yeah, only, if it, <laughs> only if it comes up yeah basically um sovt exercises really provide like a a more relaxed way to vocalize really don't they like a yeah. more managed um efficient way to vocalize Is yeah that, the vocal folds are under less pressure because yeah. there's the air below and above is somewhat more equalized so it's mm. not as it's not as forceful mm. 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 great mm. yeah so a really nice gentle way to get get into your your singing and also when you want to do range expansion that's a really nice way to do it yeah yeah okay uh, Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking to see what else we've got there. Ah, oh, oh, look at all the questions not coming in. <laughs> oh, questions, people. You need to send them through, remember? <laughs> Use your Q&A box. It's at the bottom of the screen. All right. I'm just going to say we've got 22 participants. That's good. <laughs> 22 questions there. Here we go. <laughs> all right. So, so why don't we... Beck, why don't we talk through some of the most common questions we've probably uh, had asked of us in our, our voice studios, or perhaps while we're out on the road coaching? Um, you know. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So he, you and I were chatting about this yesterday, and I think it's worth. <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to say this because I only thought about it earlier. Um, but I think it's actually worth acknowledging that as part of our conversation yesterday, we were talking about the fact that often singers come to us with questions that are about artistry and, and, and dynamics and things like that, which are really important questions, absolutely. But that we need to keep in mind that there's a hierarchy of uh, skills that we're looking for because to be able to do artistry and dynamics and things like that, you know, if our alignment and our breathing isn't spot on to begin with or, you know, set up in a way that allows efficient vocal use, then the ability to do the dynamics and do the beautiful vocal artistry is undermined before we can begin. So I think that's one of the, I certainly one of the biggest things when, when I've done BBIs and teach vocal lessons for myself. And I know we, you and I were talking about this yesterday, both of us, that, that it's very important that we just keep in mind that we've got to work on our alignment and breathing all the time. (laughs) Yeah. And I think with, with alignment, you know, unless you're looking at yourself in a full length mirror or have video videoed yourself in your singing stance, perhaps you're not going to notice some of the things that might be getting in the way of your singing. Mm. Uh, one of my more amused, you know, moments is as a person of, shall we say, um, 
I'm just vertical challenge. Um, I find that in my normal conversation with people, my chin is up because you know, I'm wanting to make eye contact with them. But of course, then that means that that, that becomes my usual head position. And when I'm singing, it actually feels a little odd to mm. have that long back of the neck, short front of the neck, you know, unless, you know, I have trained in that, you know, now it feels fine. But, you know, when I ask people to align their head, you know, and, and it's all the stuff that we know, you know, starting from the floor up, you know, everything mm. aligned from the floor up. And, and quite often, you know, when I'm asking them to consider where their eye line is, mm. Uh, that it's really easy for them to quickly adjust it because it doesn't look right to them in terms of where they where they normally have their eye line when they're singing. So if you think about you performing to an audience, how often do we lift our head and kind of sing to the audience like that? Because we're emoting outwards. It's That's such it. a powerful emotion. That's it. <laughs> um, or if perhaps uh, perhaps your normal riser position is on the back row. Mm-hmm. And so um, back row singers are often kind of like in the begging position, you know, like coming into this forward leaning position um, as though that's their way of engaging in the sound. And of course, we don't blame them for that, but it's it's not going to help with their alignment. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And I think uh, multifocal lenses, by the way, as Vicky, you're wearing your glasses today, so you remind me of that, yep. is that um, anybody wearing multifocals tend to have some you know, variances on where their head sits as well because of where they're looking through the lens. Yeah. As well as then on the risers, you add that complication in of they're trying to, which part of the lens they're looking through. Yeah. And look, I, I also notice as a, as a chorus director, uh, if, and I, you know, you're always told as a chorus director, um, direct down in your powerhouse, right? And I find that if I, if my singers look like they're starting to arc over, the then powerhouse has dropped too low. The powerhouse <laughs> starts getting higher and higher. <laughs> because, because I, I'm sort of like wanting wanting their, their alignment to straighten up and perhaps we that just needs to be a different discussion. You know, so for, for Yeah, so for chorus <laughs> singers to become self aware about that, you know, like that, that they are in charge of their alignment and mm. sometimes the director might not be entirely helping that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We've had some questions come through, Vicky. Oh, so, the first one from John Nichols. Thanks, John. If something is not quite right in someone's singing, how do you diagnose the cause of that singing issue? Short answer, long answer. Short okay. answers, go and ask someone who might have yeah. more experience. <laughs> uh, as a voice teacher, I get um, an empathetic sensation to what the person is doing. And that gives me a really good understanding of where the tension is. So um, that's if it's if it is a, a tension. Um, uh, you know, ca tension is causing the something not quite right. Mm -hmm. um, if it is something that is physiological, um, so for example, if their voice might be husky or have a harshness to it or perhaps they're having to work really hard to um, initiate sound then um, that becomes a different type of problem so that would be mm -hmm. a physiological problem and that could be caused by any number of um, issues so mm -hmm. we'll, I'll just put that throw that over into the biological slash medical side and we'll come back to it uh, Actually, can I ask John a, cl a clarifying question on, on yeah. what he's asking him? Uh, because this obviously can go many different ways, John. So I guess my question for you, if you wouldn't mind just responding, is are you, spe are you specifically saying it's a, a vocal health issue that you feel or is it are you firstly or do you feel like it's just a singing issue f firstly? And secondly, are you asking how do we diagnose vi uh, vocal concerns or how are you asking, how does the singer diagnose vocal or singing issues? Because there's a different answer there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and John, feel free to unmute if you want to give us the answer to that or just type it in, <laughs> into the chat box even. I'll just give John a second to yeah. respond to us.
you. <laughs> I, uh, oh. I was trying to type them. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> um, um, so it wasn't a medical issue. Um, okay. Um, and uh, my video is off and I have no idea why. Um, but okay. anyway, um, I, look, I'm, I'm currently... Um, oh, you disappeared. Oh, I'm now being made a panelist. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Try again, John. <laughs> uh, look, I, I'm just current. Our quartet, my quartet is currently doing recordings for this um, BHAE quartet um, competition. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, so, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of recording and um, it's sort of like, how can I, uh, there's something wrong with that recording and there's something wrong with my um, voice there, you know, at that point. Um, how do I work out why that's gone wrong? You know, what have I, how can I fix that? You know, how can I diagnose my own singing issues um, mm -hmm. or those, the, uh, my other quartet members um, so that we can sort of get a better sound in our recording, you know? Um, how do you do that, you know, when you sort of, I think, John, it comes down to what, what is it that you're hearing? Uh, I, I, well, I, I sent off a recording to the other three guys and mm -hmm. they came back with a few things like, oh, it sounds, it's sounding really good. And then they said they went through a few um, issues that weren't quite right. Like um, there's just this momentary lapse in my um, timing and I'm uh, after taking a breath, I'm coming in late, uh -huh. you know, and what's, What's caused that, you know? Is it because my brain was doing something else at the time and got lost or um, was I tense, um, you know? Like, wh why does all of a sudden your timing go off when you're just sort of in the middle of a song and you're trying to, um, you know, do a f five or six different things at the same time and maybe your breath just gets out of sync with the, the rhythm and the timing, um, because you're thinking about other things. I don't know, but uh, um, yes. it's just sort of like. <laughs> yes, yes to everything yes. you just said. Everything yes. you just said. <laughs> yeah. um, if, it's, if it's a timing issue and the breath is taking too long, then it could be whatever sound you have just left is potentially um, shutting down something happening in your articulation. So that would uh, make your breath slower. Uh, it could also mean if you've got a big jump or a, a, some sort of a change coming into the next phrase that that maybe that's slowing you down. Singable consonants are going to slow you down. Sections um, of songs that are um, tricky for you, like you know that you have to think about, you might delay ever so slightly in the approach to it. And the same way in the tricky phrases in the last thing, you delay the approach while you're thinking and it happens very subconsciously. So I would yeah, say yeah. to work through that, um, if you if you took the words away and you sang the whole thing on a on a sound like da 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 or um, you know la 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 <laughs> book 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 which is uh, one of my favourites I love, love book book <laughs> uh, so doing it that way then sort of shows you how quickly your onset needs to be uh, also do do practice with a metronome. Uh, our, our internal metronomes, as great as we think they are, they're, they're never as good as perhaps, um, you know, like one, I, I can say at the moment I'm working on a, a couple of projects on uh, virtual recordings, you know, for, for ensemble work. And one of the things that I've noticed is that when people take, and this is to a click track, so there's a, there's a, you know, a designated rhythm to this and tempo, uh, when people take a big breath, and they're, they're running late, they then speed up the next couple of words, right? So, so you might have, you know, I can't even think of a song, but let's just say it was Doe a Deer. If, I, if I'm going, Doe a Deer, a female deer, ray a drop of golden sun. However, if I took too long in that breath for ray, Doe a Deer, a female deer, Ray, a drop of golden sun, right? <laughs> somehow match back up with that rhythm. So, so that's something I see a lot of, a lot, a lot. Yeah, of. yeah. <laughs> so, so it could be um, what you're recording to as well that you need to just keep keep yeah. working 
to your whatever your backing track your teach track your guide track whether it's a click track um, working to that to time your breaths so you could even just do a you know like all the way through and then take your breath where you're supposed to and pick it up again you know it kind of comes back to what Beck and I started off talking about which was you know like vocal warm-ups vocal warm-ups are also yeah. um, Kind of like interval training in or not interval training like as in note intervals but but working through um the processes of getting through a piece of music yeah you know, you know organized segments yeah 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 does that um, help john do you, do you feel like yeah, we've sort yeah. of addressed I, your I, question i i often like I, i'm a fairly I, I you know i've got some musical training but the that's why in that previous question, which was my question, um, that I said that singing was to some extent a mysterious process because um, it sort of in, your instrument is your body. And so you've got to be so aware, as you said a bit earlier on Definitely. about self-aware. And it's, it's a real, uh, it's something that, um, you know, I think is quite difficult to develop um, when you haven't had a lot of training in singing um, and teaching in singing. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's a bit different from an instrument where, you know, I've been taught to how to play instruments and you, you, it's, it's external to you. So it's, it's somehow you are operating on it, but you are you singing, you know, and you're, you're, you're not really operating on your body or it doesn't feel like that. Well, and we can't, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's interesting, John, because the other day, um, I found, a. Uh, it wasn't a quote, but it was like a, a little um, sub article in one of my books. And it was about people who already have a really nice voice, right? They already have a lovely voice. They're actually the hardest people to teach to do something differently because they're already comfortable with their sound. Uh, but it's also, you know, if they're, if they're doing something that is going to interfere with their vocal health even though the voice might sound great you know that has to actually be be changed and undone and stepped back through in a way that um that person has to be very willing and open to uh the the change in their vocal persona absolutely and and further i was going to go from the psychological line as well um i think uh, deborah griffiths is a wonderful uh showmanship coach in Sweet Adelines, Australia. And she was working with a group that I was um, observing um, a couple of years ago. And she said that when we talk about uh, external instruments, uh, clarinets, pianos, she used a violin as the example. She was saying that, you know, that's an external instrument. You say to a violinist, that's a little flat. And they go, oh, hang on a sec. And they tweak it again, they tune it up again, and off they go. When you say something like that to a singer or the singer perceives that themselves, that's their body they they are the singer they are the instrument and so it's very hard to move beyond that psychological element of it and so it has to be taken into account as well and there's the two other aspects to that as well is that um some of what we hear from our instrument is atmospheric and some of it is neurosensive uh sensory so when we're talking about um the neurosensory perception of what we're doing compared to the atmospheric perception of what we're doing, um, those two may not always um, agree. Mm. So, so there's, there's that aspect as well. So, for example, John, in terms of what you're hearing through bone conduction, you might be going, you know what, I'm, I'm on fire here, I, I'm getting this. And then when it comes down to what's on the recording, and we hear this all the time from people who have to, we submit riser recordings and they always say to us, oh, I hate the sound of my own voice. How can you better listen to it? Uh, and, and of course, for us, we're like, what are you talking about? I, I love the sound of your voice and I hear it all the time, mm. you know, and, and yet they're, they're so tied into that um, bone conduction sound that, that they're not even really fully aware of what, what's coming out out here. Mm. So. Yeah, well, personally, I have found this whole process of, of recording our voices um, uh, in um, Vicky's uh, chorus, Sydney Harmony, um, a, a, a really extremely valuable exercise. And because uh, I've, got, I've got used to doing the recording thing and then listening to my recordings personally and go, oh, that's flat. Oh, I'm not finishing my phrases with energy. Oh, 
look at that that waveform. It's so choppy. It doesn't look very like a professional singer's waveform, you know. And like it's just so many things you can look, listen to, and watch, and you're recording and go, oh, okay. How do I fix that? I don't know. <laughs> And you touched on something else, John, that I, I find absolutely fascinating, and that is what someone's voice looks like. Yeah. You know, a, a sound wave recording is a fantastic tool to be able to determine how quickly you're moving off a singable consonant onto a vowel, whether or not that vowel is actually maintaining its shape or whether it has changed, because we see all of that on the waveform. You know, we even see things like how how noisy a breath is or whether the breath as you took it trailed off. You know, so when we might see a, you know, like the, this little t -t 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 that happens at the end of the, the breath. So I think it's a fantastic tool for singers if they've got some way of, you know, whether it's garage band or audacity, being able to kind of have a look at what, what their voice, you know, looks like um when when it's coming down in a waveform it's fascinating yeah like you see tim warwick's waveform and it's just this beautiful <laughs> envelope you know there's no cutting off <laughs> anything it's just this pure beautiful waveform and i look at mine and it's sort of like these little packets going on and then i spend all day on a recording and i, I look at it at the end and go wow it's starting to look like a tim warwick recording i must be doing something right isn't this extraordinary and, and isn't that a wonderful tool it is. It's amazing. Yeah. It's the best thing. Yeah. Here we go, everybody. From the words of John, use your riser recordings. They're a fantastic tool. Don't yeah. be scared of them. Listen to them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. We've better, we better, we better continue on to the next question. Thanks very much, John. That's much appreciated. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, question from Justine Cox. Hi, Justine. Um, do you have any suggestions for maintaining consistent vocal space and production at my higher range? Ooh. So again, this, this will come back to using uh, exercises and, and vocal warm-ups to develop the, the coordination at this range. But the other thing is no, being aware of what's causing issues with maintaining that consistent space because it could be an alignment thing because they, the chin's a little high and it's just influencing the muscle movement through here. It could be uh, the breath isn't being used efficiently in that range, or it could be the psychological brain going, oh my God, this is so high, squeeze, and that's restricting. So I guess it becomes a case of which of the, and, and that's just three of them, I'm sure there's more. Yeah. I, <laughs> so it becomes which about, one? <laughs> when I think about high range and, you know, like, um, so both of you have sung, both of us have sung classical. Mm. And so when you get up into that higher range, there are some compensations that you make in terms of your articulation. Um, now, I don't know how high you're talking about, Justine, so I'm going to assume that it's just up to about a tenor range, not... Um, not a coliatura soprano range. So I'm going to... So nothing about the G. I think it's like a G5, isn't it? But Yeah, yeah, about yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So one of the things that tends to happen as we sing higher is that our tongue wants to do the thing that the note is. So our tongue says, oh, hi, let me help. <laughs> let, me, let me go high for you. And that can trap out some of the space that you would have in your vocal tract. Uh, also, when we're talking about vowels in that higher range, being able to find a vowel that's comfortable to work through the notes on first and, and find how that feels, how that sounds, and then be able to use the, the personality of that vowel space to then apply that to the lyrics mm -hmm. that you're going to sing up there. So finding, finding the, the easiest vowel for you to sing through that range and then, then trying to mimic across yeah, the, the rest of yeah, the song. Yeah, so oohs and es tend to work quite well in, in those extremes of range. Mm. Uh, and also, um, you know, it's interesting going back to Steve Scott. You know, if we actually put too much air into those high notes, um, the vocal folds can't actually manage it. They're, they're being stretched to their thinnest when, when we're moving in the extremes of our high range. And so chances are we're just going to burst them apart. And that's when you get the, those, um, I'll call them air pockets in your sound. 
you know, you go for the note and it's there, but then a moment later it's not, and then it's there, and then it's not, and then it's there. That's actually um, happening because there's probably a little bit too much um, blastissimo happening behind <laughs> that. Um, too much pressure building up behind yeah. the folds, and you're trying to hold it back. That's it. That's it. Uh, yeah. so, so, you know, being able to do it on a bubble uh, would prob- or even a, a lip trill, trill. trill vesta, you know, Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favourites. So <laughs> or the good. internal trill as well. That'll work as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so doing that is going to stop you from putting too much air onto it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I really like about approaching high notes is if you let the air choose the high note. So, for example, you know, you can play the high note on a you know keyboard or on your pitch pipe or whatever, and then you just start exhaling, and then go for the note partway through the exhalation rather than a closed down hit the note and that just helps you to to determine whether or not you actually have possession of that note um not all notes belong to all of us so so there might be some notes that just aren't yours and that's okay and then there's that that singable range and performance range everybody this is for guys and girls (laughs) and everybody has their own singable range and performance range yeah you work to your singable range in your warm-ups and that's you pr- make sure you practice there the top of it's squeaky and not so pleasant to listen to and the bottom's a little gravelly but by singing to that range you widen your performance range mm-hmm. but you don't want to sing in performance using your singable range because yeah. that's where things start to get a little bit scary and that's unsettling you know, and, and everyone <laughs> does have um the potential to expand their range and certainly when we're talking about um, working on your high range in a very gentle way, so bubbling or something semi-occluded, like a that kind of thing, and, and just visiting and then coming back down off of your highest notes rather than trying to stay there you know, for a long time because that, that is kind of going to uh, – your stamina and, and your, your muscles are not going to like it. Uh, but when we work our upper range, it actually expands our lower range because mm. we're, we're building uh, muscle tone, muscle strength and flexibility in the vocal folds. So, um, yeah, but uh, that, that would be my suggestion for maintaining consistent vocal space. Uh, oh, another one. I've got another one for that same, same one. Um, get your tongue out of the way and practice it with your tongue out or your tongue rolled over a pencil. Um, or I even just pushed up behind your bottom yeah. teeth. So yeah, the folded tongue. So uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, so folded tongue looks like this. And I'm sorry, you know, I, I should have eaten a blue M and M or something before this, but you, that would have been more fun. But um, your tongue sits behind your behind on the inside of your lower front teeth, and the rest of the tongue folds forward out of it. So excuse me while I do this. So it looks like this. And that's giving your tongue a really nice yoga style stretch and being able to sing your stuff, sing whatever it is on that position. And when you breathe, make sure it doesn't shoot back in again. We want it to stay out there in that folded tongue position when you breathe. But it it pulls the back of the tongue away from the larynx uh, in a way that just keeps it nice and free. Yeah, and um, over the pen. And sing the whole thing like that. I'm about to sterilize that now. Um, (laughs) That's fair. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Next question. Claire, Kelly, how do you okay. encourage a soft, quiet singer to sing stronger with more confidence? <laughs> Physically or emotionally? That's the, the, there's two questions there. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to, I'll let, oh gosh. <laughs> I like going with the stronger one in terms of physically, but um, I'm actually going to go for the emotional side of this first, uh, and and then we can discuss the the stronger side. It's, well, to be honest, I think the physical will come with the with the with the psychological, really. It might, <laughs> it might, <laughs> but um, it's you know such a small part of it, really, in the scheme. <laughs> it, it really does come down to um, this is going to sound terrible, but so many people have been traumatized through their life as to what their voice sounds like to others. So they've been given some really poor feedback um, through their lifetime that Mm. uh, has been unhelpful. And if we think of, you know, it's like body shaming someone. um, And so it's 
there's that same thing you know if if someone constantly said something you know about your appearance that they didn't like then you would forever try and hide that thing about your appearance because you know um people's opinions scar us for forever so uh there may be something else going on with this person um in terms of why they believe their voice is perhaps um not something they want to kind of put out there to the rest of the world so it's small steps little things um little constant reminders yeah constant reminders but also small small achievable goals so um rather than getting someone to jump up and sing in a quartet straight up you know for example giving them um little goals where where they might be singing with someone else but you you um slowly take away the training wheels once they are confident in themselves with with what they're doing a lot of the time they're quiet because they're worried they're going to sing a wrong note and they think the whole world is going to actually um fall down on them if they sing a wrong note like they've got such high expectations you know and a lot of the time it's because they have a lot of respect for the singers around them that they think that they could never live up to those those same sounds and skills so giving them the opportunity to hear themselves, encourage them constantly. Um, yeah, that I, I, I see it all the time, all yeah. the time, you know. And I think in, also, you know, if, you, if there was a one-on-one -on -one conversation happening between the singer and a coach or a director or a music team member or somebody they trust, where there could be a conversation to find out a little bit more about why they might be singing softly, do you know, because there, there could be, as Vicky said, there's many psychological reasons that lead to this. Uh, and it's quite sad, actually, how many people have been told in their life they can't sing. Like, it's really, really frighteningly sad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, understand that because some of the tools, you know, including things like, the, you know, the positive affirmation stuff and all that sort of thing are really great tools depending on the individual. And so, you know, it's finding, it's understanding them a little bit more and then understanding or which tool is going to be the most effective one for them of that nature. Yeah, and it depends on what their what their skill set is too. Like I, mm. I remember many, many years ago, I had a, a lady come to me for voice lessons and she'd been told that she was tone deaf by mm. her family. And she was basically told that she wasn't permitted to sing around the house by her husband and children. Anyway, so she couldn't really afford to have a ton of lessons. So she'd basically signed up for, I think it was, you know, like four weeks or something like that. And she had a goal in mind that I didn't know what it was at the time. And so we had to start off with what we call speech level singing, because if I played a note on the piano and asked her to sing it, she would have been, you know, you know, not like, near it. <laughs> and so it started off with me asking her to um, talk sing. And we went through and it was getting close on to Christmas time. So, so we were doing silent night and she basically would copy me doing a, an inflection in speech. So it'd be silent night, holy night. And then that slowly became notes. And we, we went through probably, you know, a, maybe a Christmas song each week. Well, that was, and then I didn't see her again, but I got a card from her in the January and the card was to thank me because she went to a carols by candlelight with her family and she sang Aww. and it was just the nicest thing you know that she would she had the confidence to sing you know because she had that opportunity to just go step by step through it in a way that wasn't confronting and yeah. and i and i think that's to not confront a singer with this is your this is the expectation right now is especially if i have trauma that's yeah. too hard and then, then if we just jump over just for a moment to the, the physical side of this not everybody is a booming you know operatic soprano either so you know they might be a quiet and soft singer because they are a quiet and soft person <laughs> Yeah. You know, sure, they can build some more strength through, uh, you know, again, checking alignment, building br uh, breath work and, and potentially vocal yeah. work, depending on what yeah. they're doing with the phonation. But otherwise, they might just be a softer person. It'd be interesting to know how they speak, actually. Yeah, yeah. I I'm actually working with a singer at the moment who's 
that have got that sort of thing going on. They're actually quite softly spoken. Mm. And then she's, she wants to sing louder. And it's just like, um. When we talk about breath support, uh, breath support or, um, you know, coming from a, a classical world, uh, mm. a podgy breathing mm. is resisting the exhalation as in resisting the drop of the ribs you know and being able to have that that slower return of the diaphragm while we maintain the expansion in our ribs now doing that provides more subglottal underneath the vocal folds breath pressure to bring the vocal folds together in a firmer way in in doing so we're not getting air escape through the vocal folds and we get a cleaner clearer sound that is so it's less breathy it's got more tone to it. And if someone is, is working on those skills, their voice mm. will become stronger. Being able to engage through this, this upper abdominal muscle just underneath the sternum, which, you know, we'll give it its proper name. It's the area of the epigastrium. If we're, ex, ex, you know, if we're engaged... Through... Not the diaphragm, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> epigastrium. You can't feel your diaphragm. <laughs> It just does its thing. It's a one-way muscle. The Inhalation only, involuntary. <laughs> That's it. No. So the upper abdominal muscles. Just had to get that out of my chest. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and how much pe do people provide, like, uh, apply abdominal um, tension trying to get uh, a strong count? And it's not, right? It's not the lower abdominal tension. No, get rid of that. Yeah, no throat tension. Yeah, so anyway... We could, we could Sorry, I, I got sidetracked. Yeah, we could talk about that ad nauseum. So, so I'm thinking in terms of, yeah, vocal skills um, most definitely, but also I, I would want to know what's going on with that person. Yeah. And Claire's just said that uh, this, this person does speak softly, but yeah. Yep. Thanks, Claire. It, look, I think we've got time for maybe one more question, okay. which is perfect because we have one more question there. <laughs> yep, I've got Rob Lee. Uh, in Victoria, we are under pretty severe lockdown conditions, unable to leave our homes, really. I like to sing with others because singing to myself is not very interesting. Maintaining motivation is hard and I find I have lost a lot of singing fitness. A large part of this is tension and, and anxiety. What to do? Oh, Rob, you've just, you've just, that's the $50 million question, isn't it? And I think that all of us who are not able to sing in our ensembles are experiencing exactly what you have just uh, yeah. put out there. Uh, I'm going to talk about a motivational exercise first, and then I'll jump over to you, Beck. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> if, if you have time in your day, Rob, where you do something um, as part of your daily routine. If you could put some vocal exercises into that, so as a, you know, uh, we've talked about this before, Beck, the turning on the kettle. You oh, know, yeah, that Darlene Rogers one, such a great idea. Yeah, you know, if you're going <laughs> to boil the kettle, then, you know, do a, a hissing exercise or um, if for those who know about Farinelli exercise, that's one of my favourites. So if you, if you uh, I'll, I better put that in the chat somewhere. Just look it up. There's, there's hey. tons of them on YouTube. Um, if you're not a tea drinker, the coffee machine works as well. When you press the button, same deal. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. So, so have something in your day where you um, do a vocal exercise before you do the thing that you normally do. Uh, and, and even if it's just a breathing exercise and you do that for a week, you will find that that starts become motivating you to do more. Uh, I must admit that I'm not very good at a five-minute vocal exercise. I get distracted and end up doing a 40-minute vocal exercise and then I don't have the cup of tea. I don't unstack the dishwasher. None of the things don't happen because I just get obsessed by... That's, that's a science thing, though. There's a recent article that just came out about that. Really? Yeah, it was saying that if you if you got something you've got to like put into your routine and it's like, oh, trying to find the time and motivation to do it, do just one thing, you know, one step, and you end up doing forty minutes of it in the end because you get yeah. so motivated. <laughs> That's what I do, you know, and and then I forget that I was going to do something else because I've been singing. The other thing, Rob, um, find a song that you love, and and sing it, and it doesn't matter if you've never sung it before make it your project, you know, download the sheet music, you know, buy the sheet music through either musicnotes.com or sheet music plus or one of those. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It can be a karaoke thing, right? So, you know, get a backing track 
and and teach yourself to sing that song uh there are a bunch of us um out here in uh you know barbershop land that are actually um having a bit of fun on friday or saturday nights kind of having zoom karaoke um <laughs> so, so check that out you might not you know you might have some friends some of your friends that you would normally sing with maybe you could do a zoom karaoke night that's always uh, fun because then you've got your, your list of songs you've worked on. Because how many people don't do karaoke because they haven't worked up a song? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm not singing in front of people. I haven't prepared it. Come I know. On. And yeah, um, from my quartet, my beautiful bass, um, Crystal, such a karaoke singer, you know, just throw the lyrics and she'll have a crack at it. It's wonderful, you know. So so I, I would suggest having something else that's going to keep you singing, Rob. And, yeah, vocal ease, definitely. Try and try and give yourself a little routine. And there's a bunch that are out there in um, YouTube land that, you know. Yeah. You could... And along that, along that same line, Rob, you might also want to try, and this is for everybody actually in, in isolation or, or just looking for something more to do from a singing perspective, there's a great Facebook group, group called um, Barbershop Tags, I think it's called. Yep. Uh, and people just sort of randomly go on there and say, I'm going to sing this part for this tag. Who wants to do the rest of the tag with me? And you record it with the acapella app. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by, you know, having those little goal projects that you're working towards because you're recording for other people, that's sort of going to, again, that's a five minute job. That's sort of, oh, thanks. Thanks, Dan. There we go. <laughs> um, it's, it's a five minute job that sort of gets you involved and then the next step you know you'll listen to it back and you go as john said you listen to it and went hang on a minute i can make that better and suddenly 40 minutes has gone by yeah and you've been singing again and then you know you finish one you hear how amazing it is you know um, i've done a couple of collabs um in the last couple of um, months which has been so much fun uh and you want to do more once you start doing it so it's getting back into it really yeah and also it, it kind of, um, it reminds me of a question that I was actually asked by um, uh, someone who, I don't know whether they're online tonight. Uh, the question was actually from Tony Sykes. So I'm going to say what the question was uh, because this kind of applies to being motivated as well. The question was, what advice would I give to someone brand new to barbershop? Uh, and what advice would I give to someone who's been doing it for quite a number of years? And so the thing about someone brand new to barbershop, I said to get your hands on some recordings of really good groups, mm. great quartets, great choruses, you know, the, the ones that are, you know, the medalist level uh, international champions and train your ear to what is good. Train your ear to the style because then anything less than that, you'll, it will become intolerable and you will work <laughs> to try and get that same sound out of yourself. Uh, for someone who's been doing it for a long time, um, the same, the same answer. Uh, saturate your ear with really good barbershop, you know, and, and then you will not um, put up with less than really good you know so you'll be striving towards that you, your ear will be going oh you know yes that's what forward motion is and that's what uh, <laughs> i just got the thanks vicky save me from typing it out um yeah so in terms of forward motion and nuance and all of that uh just getting that that sound in your in your um mm. mind's ear if you like so going back to rob's question i if he would um, perhaps put a whole bunch of awesome barbershop into his playlist and and it doesn't have to be the same group, you know, like it's something else I, I sort of... Men's, you know, women's mixed. <laughs> oh, yeah, look, I, I, I've got... I, I must confess that, you know, there are certain voices in different voice parts that I prefer. Mm -hmm. And so if I was singing that particular voice part, I would probably pick the groups that have the voice part that is mine that I can most relate to. Mm. So, so thinking about that too, you know, like, Oh, I love that person's voice. You'll probably find when you say, I love that person's voice, there's going to be something in it that, that is relatable to you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to add to what Vicky's saying, cause I agree absolutely with listen, listen, listen to lots of barbershop, lots of really great barbershop, uh, recent and older champions as well. There's some fantastic stuff in, in some of the um, older 
tracks out there as well. So listen to that. The other thing is that no matter how long we've been singing, we none of us can go past having some lesson time with someone, either be a PBI or something more consistent. Uh, you know, Pavarotti yep. was having singing lessons all the way up until his death. Tony um, Bennett still has voice lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's back to that, you know, the, the sympathetic vibration, atmospheric sound, you know, what we hear versus what's actually happening is often two different things. And so having somebody else external to us listening and just pointing things out, you know, things become really comfortable in our body and we think we're spot on. It's not just somebody goes, lose things even a millimeter or so in our alignment and then we go oh actually that feels so much better so just checking in fairly regularly with a vocal coach of some capacity no matter where we are on our journey is a really vital part of the process as well yeah and also that things take a, a long time to learn mm. so as adult <laughs> learners we we're often uh, impatient with ourselves because conceptually we understand the process right so, so, yep, I understand what you're telling me about breathing. I understand what you're telling me about phonation or resonance. And However, I did it twice. I did it twice. Yeah, I must have yeah, it. <laughs> this is it. However, can I just say to everybody that from my experience with certainly learning um, how to breathe diaphragmatically, um, that it takes probably a good 12 months to do it consciously right and then it takes another three years to do it subconsciously so so if you if you've just started out at this and you are maybe you know a year and a half into this and you're saying why isn't breathing easier well my answer to you is you're 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 probably part way through your journey uh, and even then um we still constantly and consciously mm. work on those those very basic if we call them skills constantly absolutely which comes right sort of back to the very beginning of of tonight's conversation where we were saying that uh yeah absolutely john uh, it's ten thousand hours of mastery uh mm. you know we we come back to the fundamentals of alignment and breathing and phonation because they are fundamentals that they're like a you have to do them all the time for the rest of our lives because they're constantly changing and evolving as our bodies change and as we change and as we learn more in one particular area, it affects other areas. So it's, it's not something that ever really is completely 100% mastered. It's always something that just needs evolution on it. Yeah, and also our bodies um, being the, the organic instrument that it is, and <laughs> let's just call it the most complicated uh, wind instrument in existence. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> it also changes subtly um, from day to day, week to week. So, um, you know, again, that thing of tension and anxiety, emotional changes, uh, the fact that we're dealing with, with uh, a, a whole new normal that's not normal and how do we respond to that? You know, I, I, I totally get it. You know, and if, if your instrument was a piano or a violin or a mandolin or guitar, whatever, that that instrument is always consistent, like your playing of it might not be, but the instrument <laughs> is always consistent. Whereas for singers, our instrument is not always consistent. So anything that's going on with us, be it fatigue, lack of sleep, um, stress and anxiety, stress and anxiety, anything that is happening with you physically is also going to have a knock on effect for your voice. Mm. And if we think about something like the fact that the, the vocal folds were never, well, we, we say this, um, the vocal folds weren't actually designed for the purpose of pitch. They're a valve. They're our mammal blowhole. And so, so when well, we, we'll put Vicky. <laughs> <that's our> blowhole, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a valve. It's to stop stuff getting in our lungs, right? It's a valve. <laughs> and so somehow, miraculously, we've, we've managed to turn it into this amazing, you know, um, activator, uh, well, you know, sound thing, vibrator for, for our voice. And when we, when we look at that and then think about why, you know, some people are more predisposed predisposed to um, laryngitis, pharyngitis, or some sort of dysphonia. The reason is because our body actually shuts that bit down first because 
it's not actually considered an essential tool to be able to put pitch on this stuff. So whilst you're coughing and whilst you've got a sore throat, whilst you've got all of that stuff happening, your voice is kind of becoming, in, your larynx is becoming inflamed. And it's going to go, you know what? I don't care that you can't get a note right now. I'm going to protect your body from whatever is physically going on. And yeah. so that's that's the other thing that we kind of have to have to deal with. You know, many of us have sung through colds and head colds and, you know, the whole gamut of, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and people with asthma and people with allergies and people with, you know, and we yeah. can still get out there and, and do our our best to produce a beautiful sound. But these, our body is a, you know, the thing that's, keep, you know, walks us around all day. <laughs> Yeah, that's all the I, um, for us. Yeah, it, it just strikes me that you know, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, look this up. But it's um, Maslow's hierarchy of need, and it really, you know, in times like this, it just really does boil back down to that. That we have to make sure that all the foundational things, like being safe and you know, mental health and all those sorts of things, are addressed first, because you know that's going to influence everything that's going on in our body, including our voice. So. Well, I, I just want to add a little bit to that. I know we're probably going yeah. over time. Yeah, uh, I think we've got to finish up. <laughs> okay, so so when we when we even look at the names of the cartilage of the voice, um, the the forward one, which is the thyroid cartilage, uh, that actually translates to shield. And when we hear that someone is upset or perhaps not quite feeling themselves, it hides their voice hides behind that shield. Yeah, you get that tight so, feeling, sort of that it. well in the throat feeling. That's it. And so so the shield is there to protect you. But, uh, you know, we, we kind of get that sense of that um, instability when, when we're not feeling ourselves, when, when mm. things aren't quite how we want them to be. And the voice is an emotional tool, first mm. and foremost. Mm. So Absolutely. Yeah. So, so look after yourselves, number one, <laughs> physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and keep using it, please. Um, oh, yes. Keep using your voice because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Uh, so, so do whatever you can every day to maintain some vocalising. Yeah. As I said in the, the vocal health class a couple of weeks ago, you know, talk to the family. You know, it's a novel idea. <laughs> talk to the dog for a pet. <laughs> call somebody. If you live alone, call people. Call somebody every day. Just yeah. something to make sure you're using your voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could probably should like finish up. We could talk about this for hours. But, we you know. could. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised. You know, we, we have just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good. I've been sitting back listening to the whole thing. It's, <laughs> it's good. Um, I was going to give you a wrap up, but that was actually quite a good note to finish on, I think, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So as, um, as, as, as we say, look after your voice and look after yourself. Uh, and thanks. So a huge thanks, uh, Vicky and Beck, for sharing your expertise with us again tonight. Uh, so everyone, keep an eye now on our YouTube channel. Uh, tonight's session will be uploaded there um, in the coming days. And all of our previous BHA Live sessions are also available there. So please check them out by going to YouTube and searching for Barbershop Harmony Australia or just go straight to the BHA website and follow the links on the homepage there and you'll find what you're looking for. I've also just posted some links into the chat window. Hopefully I sent them to everybody. Yes, I did. Uh, let's take a look there as well and grab them before we finish up, which will be very soon. Now our next session will be in four weeks from today. So we're having a short break before the next session. This is gonna be another BHA town hall. Um, a couple of things we'll be discussing there. Uh, we'll give an update on the progress with a membership survey. Uh, we'll have a brief update from uh, each of the councillors as well as a couple of other exciting announcements. So that'll be on the 11th of September. So put that in your calendars. Uh, and we'd love to see you as many of we as many of you there as we can. Uh, and as John mentioned earlier, uh, many of you have hopefully seen that we have launched the National Quartet E Challenge. So this is an opportunity for you all to get a chance to compete with your quartets by a video entry, uh, but of course doing it in a socially responsible way. And this also includes doing a separate recording like Beck was talking about earlier using apps such as Acapella. Uh, we have a lot of information on our website on different ways you can go about submitting some entries to there. Um, 
So of course, if you uh, rules for this may vary from state to state as to whether you can get together or whether you have to sing virtually via some software. But take a look at the website, please. We've got a lot of information on there and that'll help you with hopefully everything you need to know. So a big thanks again, Vicky and Beck for tonight's session. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Hope you all have a great weekend. We'll see you all in four weeks time. Good night.